Okay, before I start, I just wanted to show you the missing uh, thing that the other guys forgot to show you. Uh, this is called 3D Tin, and it's uh, it's a web only, like a pure uh, HTML application that allows you to do uh, very, very simple 3D modeling on the web. And it has all the standard features. You kind of can drag and drop kind of simple, simple objects. You can create templates from more complex objects. And uh, you can build very, very nice and things. But it's really meant for, for people who have no background in 3D modeling. So it's meant for as a pure, like low, lowest level educational tool. And uh, this is uh, developed by a friend of mine living in Montreal. So I promise him to show you it. And it's very well, very much used in the, in the maker communities. Right. So. You have a small wireless network problem. I'm going to talk about a software called uh, OpenSCAD. Some people call it OpenSCAD, but it sounds a little bit too much like OpenSCAD, and so we like to call it OpenSCAD. So some native English speakers are not so happy about the alternatives. Um, so OpenSCAD is a 3D modeling tool. It's really well known in the RepRap communities and in the, kind of com uh, in the enthusiast 3D printing communities, but evidently it's not so well known outside of those communities. So we had to figure out how to deal with that. Um, just a little bit about myself. I'm, uh, I'm a software developer and a hacker and a thinker. And my background is C++ and 3D visualization. And uh, I've been working with 3D software for, for almost 20 years. And uh, so 3D software that I helped develop is being used by CERN. Uh, it's a library called Coin3D. And it's also been used by Apple in Keynote. So it's, uh, but after a while, we just kind of, the, the company that was employing me, they decided to kill it. And I just figured out, let's, let's move on. So I started tinkering with electronics back in 2006. And I discovered the RepRap project. And I started working on that in 2008. And uh, I started on OpenSCAD in 2009. And since then, I got stuck. And that's what I do. Um, so, OpenSCAD is like a free, free software, open source on all platforms. So uh, there's no like business or economy around it. So to kind of pay the rent and to eat, I work as a, as a freelance consultant. And uh, I try to work on interesting things, but it goes up and down. But I've been working a bit for MakerBot. I've been working a bit for a 3D printing company in Austria, doing printing of medical implants. And, uh, and that's a bit. So, um, since OpenSCAD really grew out of the early RepRap community, it was only meant to scratch an itch in those communities. Uh, it has a certain kind of weaknesses and strengths that are not obvious. So I'm going to talk a little bit about kind of why and what and when and what happened and, and how this little thing fits together. Uh, after the <coughs> introduction, I will give a live tutorial where I'm going to kind of model things from scratch in OpenSCAD to let you see what is possible to do. And, uh, and how you will build up 3D models. Um, I will talk about who uses OpenSCAD uh, in the world. And I'll go through a lot of, kind of images of examples that shows you kind of interesting things that has been built. So uh, what is OpenSCAD? So first of all, it's a 3D modeling tool, evidently. Um, it's a solid 3D modeling tool, meaning that it's meant for creating solid models, meaning watertight models, uh, so-called uh, two-manifold surfaces, meaning that it is always should, the results should always be printable in terms of that there are no cracks that you have to repair. 
Uh, that's not always the case, but, but that's kind of the idea, that we try to enforce the solid constraint so that you know that whatever you do, you don't have problems like we had in, in SketchUp that surface disappeared. What you see is what you get uh, when you have rendered your model. It is solid, otherwise it couldn't be rendered. Uh, instead of using the mouse uh, to draw like to draw uh, objects and and uh, and sculpt things, we use a textual description. So we actually write uh, uh, source code to create your model. So you could say, if you want a sphere, you write sphere. If you want a cube, you write write cube, and you will get exactly what you you write. Uh, the good thing about source code uh, is that, first of all, it's human readable. You can see exactly what's going on. You can insert comments in your code so other people can also understand your, the intent of your design, not only the design itself. And you can, it's compact, and you can version control it easily. You can check it in GitHub, and you can see, check your changes over time very, very easily without using specialized uh, <coughs> tools that do visual differences. And the good thing about this is also that it really en uh, enforces and uh, motivates people to share and reuse uh, their models. And it's a little bit like, uh, if you know about Arduino, Arduino had made an uh, accidental feature in Arduino is that they made it very hard to, to create hex files that you upload into your microcontrollers. It used to be very, very common to do that in all this. But Arduino said that they, 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 you, you open the source code in, in the editor and you program it onto your microcontroller. Uh, as accidental because I'm not sure if they really, really thought that this was going to happen. But what happened was that everyone had to share the source code to be able to share their, their programs. And the same time, with, same thing with OpenSCAD is that you are enticed to share your, you don't have to, but you're enticed to share your, your source code to share your object. And uh, it creates a really, really strong like, community pressure to actually do that, which means that you, you get a lot, of more, you have a lot more sharing and then a lot more derivative objects and uh, a lot more ideas that comes from, from, from that fact. So, we do have a similar approach to, to what you have seen earlier with, with SketchUp. We use basic building blocks to create, like, your, to scaffold up your, your ideas, your designs. And then you use uh, operations to kind of to change those objects. And those operations, that the basic operation we support is, is something called CSG. This stands for Constructive Solid Geometry, which means you can take an object and you can subtract another object, or you can intersect another object, or you can just add another object to it. So you can gradually kind of build up or cut away uh, from your initial uh, design. And, but in addition to that, we also support then programming constructs that makes it easier to script certain things that are repetitive. And, but and one of the most important things that we, uh, we do is parametric modeling, meaning that uh, parametric, I don't mean parametric in a mathematical sense, I mean parametric in a logical sense. You say, I have a model and I want to kind of to tune a certain aspect of that model, and I decide, with, I decide myself which aspect I want to tune or want to change. Uh, that aspect could be uh, math mathematic, but in this case, mathematic parameterization is a kind of a specialization of, of kind of logic uh, parameterization. So, for instance, you could say I want to build a Lego Lego piece. The typical parameters I would use as Lego piece would be, okay, it would be how big it is, not how many. Uh, dot, how many uh, uh, units does it have in each direction? So this is like a typically a two times three Lego, pi Lego piece. I can make it, make it two times five. So the parameters would then be two and five. One times four. Another parameter can be I want to make a Duplo instead of a Lego, uh, which is like the bigger pieces. So that would be typically be a parameter I choose first, Duplo or Lego, just with the, with, the, with the text, and then the parameter comes afterwards. So in that way, you can you really are free to to decide exactly what you're going to parameterize and, and how it's going to work. So, why doesn't this already exist in the world? And, well, it kind of exists, and it's called SolidWorks. And SolidWorks is a very nice piece of software, and it does everything that we do and, and a lot, lot more. But it's a bit expensive. Actually, it's so expensive that if you try to find out how much it costs, they won't tell you. Uh, they want you to call them and have a meeting and, and figure things out. And <laughs> by looking at looking at the web, it's, it appears that it costs approximately 4,000 euros for one single user license, so the, the entry version of SolidWorks, plus 30% of that every year to kind of make get upgrades, which is kind of a little bit out of the reach of hobbyists and, uh, and enthusiasts. And most other people that are not really well well paid. And uh, 
Actually, uh, the original Mendel <coughs> design for RepRap was actually built in a, in a similar software called Solid Edge. It was built by a, a PhD student at CELS at the University of Bath. And uh, well, that, since he is a mechanical engineer, he used Solid Edge because that's the tool that he was taught to use. Uh, but that made, kind of, made it hard to, to take the Mendel design and do something with it. So at some point, some people figured out, let's remodel the whole Mendel. So the whole Mendel has been remodeled in like five or six different tools by now. So people can take that design and, and change it. Op also open a scan. Um, so open a was it really grew out of the RepRap community because we were back in Vienna in, in 2008. We were tinkering with 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 the rep straps. We didn't have any way to to get all the parts built for RepRap, so we modified and built our own uh, Cartesian axis and built our own extrusion mechanisms. And what we're doing is we try to design mechanical parts to improve our own design. And we started using 3D design tools called uh, Digit Blender, and we use something called Art Evolution, and. It all kind of works really well for the first object, but then when you go back and say, oh, this hole is going to be two millimeters to the left, you have to kind of delete the hole and add it again, and it's a lot of manual work when you know that you just have to check, create one parameter, and that is where should the hole be. And so we figure out there is a missing piece of software here, and we need to figure out how to get it or make it. So we just decided to make it. And, uh, and the same, at the same time, the developer community is, is very focused on multi-platform. Because everyone has their own uh, platform of choice. So some people, a lot of people in the RepRap community use Linux as the main platform. Uh, like the last kind of, eventually a lot of Linux people moved over to Mac because Linux was kind of difficult to maintain. Now they are going back again because Apple is getting more and more evil. And there was also a lot of Windows users. Most users of OpenSK are Windows users. So we need to be kind of, you need to kind of uh, be able to give software to, to all these, these different uh, types of, of users. Um, and I talked about sharing. It's uh, in the early repro community, but also now, when you make it a, a design change to an existing system and you improve some of the stuff that other people have worked on, you really want to give that improvement back to the community. And hopefully, people will take your improvement and make another improvement. So it's extremely important that we, everyone use design tools that, are not, that don't lock you into buying expensive software or say, ah, oh, you can make improvements, but you can only do it if you have a Mac. And people say, well, I don't have a Mac, so what do I do? And I say, well, then you, you cannot partake in this particular discussion. So it's important to open up that, that discussion and that uh, community to, to as many people as possible and uh, doing that then across platforms. And that's also why it's really important to have it open source, because if people don't like my software, but they like my ideas, uh, they can take my software and change it uh, to their liking. And then we can talk about later if you want to merge those two into the same software again. And, but, and the, the convenience, as I mentioned earlier, was that the, one of the main, uh, main things that makes it important to have such a tool is to, you don't have to remodel and remodel and remodel because you spend so much time doing 3D modeling while what you want to do is improve a system. And the system has really nothing to do with 3D modeling. It's just like one aspect of the system. So I will skip a uh, little bit of this and you can, uh, we can talk about history later. It's a kind of a really a fun topic to talk about, but it's, it'll take forever because the history is long. So, but shortly, we started in 2009, uh, realizing that we needed to, to create a design tool. We went through a few iterations. We wrote, wrote some software uh, as plugins for other software and decided that the plugin was not good enough. We had something called CSG Evaluator that was uh, but used a lot. And we created something called MetaCAD and in the end, we just had to scrap it because the underlying uh, uh, software engines we used were too instable. So, so while uh, me and Philip who started our original tool, we were depressed that we had to scrap it. Another friend of us called Clifford, he went ahead and just called it open as over the weekend uh, as a proof of concept. And uh, eventually I then took over the program uh, and the project and, and started and uh, went with it further in 2010. So, but what you'll see, uh, I guess, when you start using it, especially, and may maybe not so much in my, my examples, is that uh, OpenSK is optimized for developer time because it's one person uh, on, uh, and I have like maybe one day and two evenings every week I can spend time on it. So I really have to kind of figure out how to, how to write code as efficient as possible without thinking too much and without having to sit for days and days and days and, and fixing it. So 
so some things like we, we figure out, let's not write the text editor. Just put in the most basic stuff possible and then let people deal with their own text editors. And rather have good ways of connecting together things. Make a command line interface so people can interface with our software from other softwares instead of having to use a GUI that we don't really want to spend time working on. So, so keep in mind that this is like a one man spare time project and uh, until someone steps up and wants to contribute time, that's kind of how it, how it seems to be. And that's like the, I guess that's the idea of most open source software that before they grow to big and famous, they are one man standing in front and just kind of pushing it forward as quickly as he can. And maybe someday it will become big. So with that, I'll just go to uh, make some objects and uh, explain what I'm doing. And afterwards, I'll just show you some, some examples and some screenshots of more complicated things. Projector has a bit lower resolution, but I guess we'll manage. Okay. So, as I mentioned, uh, if you want a cube, you write a, you write cube, and you get the cube. Can you all see this? I can make it a little bit. Oop. Good. And you don't. And if you want the cube to be in a certain shape, the default cube is going to be a one millimeter cube. But you can say it's going to be like, for instance, 10 times 10 times 8. You'll get a 10 times 10 times 8 cube. And the syntax uh, I write this code in is inspired by C uh, because we were all C programmers. So we kind of decided to use a syntax that was easy for us. It might not be easy for everyone else, but it's just remember to put semicolons where they should be, and it should be OK. Um, we can also make spheres. These are the very, very basic primitives. Again, it's a sphere with a radius of, of one. So we can make it a radius of, for instance, six. You will get the cube. You get the sphere. And we can also add parameters to it. We can say, let's, let's make the cube centered. So we, we set the center parameter to true, and it will be centered. So now we have a sphere and a cube on top of each other. And if you want to move this thing around, you can't move with the mouse. Maybe you should add that at some point, but it's a text editor. So to move, you use the mathematical function called translate. So we translate the sphere uh, a certain number of, to a certain, a certain coordinates. So in this, tape, in this case, 12 units along the x-axis. <coughs> so we have then uh, three in a cube. Now, the last primitive we support is called uh, a cylinder. And again, we can make it have a radius, and we can give it a height. I'll use a feature here that we call the percent operator. It will make objects trans transparent, so it's possible to see through them while you do some uh, operations on other objects. Let's center this one as well. Uh, and then let's move it. You can also move it in a negative direction if you want. Oh, there is a question still. How, how, many, how many elements do you have? Basic elements do you have? Yeah. Do you have a list of them? Have yeah, we, we have a list of them. 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 So I can, have an idea? I can do that quickly. Um, <coughs> this is the OpenSCAN website. And in documentation, uh, we have something called the cheat sheet. And the cheat sheet. Uh, it's like a, a basic overview of uh, all the, 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 the basic features. Mm -hmm. And you can see here that for 3D objects, we have sphere cube, cylinder, and polyhedron. And in the future, we could easily add things like platonic solids and uh, uh, maybe even uh, yeah, Archimedean solids, if you really want to have uh, more, give the users more freedom to start with a, more, uh, the, with a better shape. And for, so for cylinders, we can also say we can have two radiuses uh, ready. Uh, so you can make the other radius one. And it would be like a, a, a truncated cone. Or we can make it zero, and it would be a, a full cone. So 
so now that we have like a basic 3D objects, um, we can start doing operations on them. So one of the operations that uh, that we support is uh, naturally the, the, the union operation that we take two objects and just merge them together. And uh, <coughs> let's just kill the cylinders. So as in C or C++, you can use the slash slash uh, as a comment. If you just kind of comment out this part so it's not visible, except it's visible for the programmer. So you can keep it there for later and uh, or leave it as a comment. So you can take a union of, of, uh, of two objects. Well, you're not objects. You can't really see the difference because they are still uh, in, in, this, in this view. <coughs> but I can, I can, for instance, translate it less. So now uh, these, these two objects are, are then merged together. And if you look at the uh, look at the edges, you can let's see. Uh, I have to do it in Seagull. If you look inside, you can see that uh, the cube, the sphere doesn't actually penetrate. Uh, the digital geometry doesn't penetrate the cube. So it's actually a valid solid model that can be easily exported and, and worked with it in uh, an annual software. Yep, let's see. So back to there. Another operation we support is called the difference, where we take the difference between one object. So one object is a positive and the other object is a negative. And you then get the uh, cube minus the sphere. And you can even uh, add more children to this operation. So say I can, I can, in the same time, just subtract the cylinder. In this case, the cylinder was actually outside of the, of the object. So in this case, I can just uh, move it around by having, making it transparent. So I can make it so it intersects, take away the the debug, debug operator, and then you have an object that kind of gradually is carved away uh, from the initial cube. And the last operator we support, uh, let's go back, is the intersection. So if you now go back to a union, you see. So I, I can create intersection between, between two objects or more. And you then sit back with the with what is uh, covered by both volumes. And by successively using or, or creating a hierarchy of these operations, you could easily create like a, a more and more gradually larger and more complex object by just uh, starting with simple building blocks and, and moving it up. And you can always, at any point in time, just focus on one object and work on that while you comment out the rest. Or uh, we can even do things like, I want to render only the sphere. You can use the exclamation mark and you'll only look at the sphere while uh, working with while the whole thing is rest the rest of the thing is there, and you put it back again, and it will then apply all the operations. So these are the basic uh, the basic three uh, uh, D primitives. So, but we have a different way of also creating three D objects, and that's by starting with a two D primitive and and uh, extruding it in space. So for two D primitives, we have the same, the same situation. We have we have a square, and the square has a has a size. It has a it has a thickness here, but that's just for illustration, because somehow OpenGL wants us to render things that are real. Uh, you have a circle again with a with a radius. I forgot the semicolon. And then again, in 2D space, you can, you can do uh, the, the Boolean operations and get diff, diff, uh, different zero intersections or, or unions of 2D objects. Sorry? Yeah. Can you increase the number of polygons which are representing the circles? In yeah. Case? So. So the question was if uh, the, the number of polygons used to represent these surfaces can be changed. And uh, yeah, we, we use a relatively low number of polygons just because we want to speed up the, the rendering of the object. But it's possible to, to for each uh, primitive, we can set a special variable called fn 
and specify the number of segments we want to use for that primitive. Uh, which, why didn't this work? It's already 16. Thanks. <laughs> right, so th for 32, we get more. And we can also put like two larger numbers if you want to have a smooth surface. Mm, one more question. Uh, can you just uh, take uh, one polygon from the net inside and manipulate with it, or you need another object and put it there? And then, like, I don't know, uh, make a hole in it, or I don't know, just operate like in Maya Autodesk program, like more, yeah. no, you keep, more uh, professional tools or okay. like that. So the question is if you could if you could, could take one one yeah, polygon from inside an object and, and work with that. No, you can't do that because it's very hard to identify that polygon without using a visual tool. You would have to pick on your mouse. Yeah. And the problem is that it's totally possible to do it. It's just that if you do it, the textual representation of that model is going to be very hard to read. So it's uh, it goes a little bit against having a human readable uh, code. But yeah, it, it could be possible, uh, but it's not possible today. You could also say that for the entire entire file, I want to I want to use uh, a certain number of, of polygons. Or I can also say that I want to have one millimeter precision. It will make it one millimeter precision. Or if I want to say three millimeter precision, it will it will change it accordingly. Uh, so now that we have a, a 2D object, we can, uh, we can turn it into a 3D object by cert doing certain extrusions. So I can do a linear extrude with a height of 20. It will create a solid object for this. I can even do things like I can, uh, I can twist it 45 degrees while doing extrusion, and you'll get like a, a twisted object. But it's not very useful except if you do Maybe if you do screws, most if you do funny, funny boxes. Uh, in addition to have like linear extrusion, uh, we can also do uh, rot rotating rotational surfaces. So if I now translate uh, it away from the origin a bit, let's say, and I, I rotate extrude it. I would get a, a rotation surface. So with this, you can build them uh, one class of more advanced objects than you can with basic primitives. So this gives us already a toolbox which is possible to build relatively OK uh, models, uh, as long as you are in the, you're constrained by something that is relatively mechanical in nature, since we're using very, very, very basic primitives. So once you want to kind of once you want to break out of that box, it's also possible to define your own primitives. So in 2D space, you can define a polygon. So you just specify the vertices. You just have to get used to the list syntax. So it's a list of, of, uh, of vertices. And if you get this, you have a, you have a triangle in, in 2D space. Uh, you can also define objects, and you can, of course, this triangle is a valid, it's a totally valid 2D object, 2D object, so you can do all the same operations on this object that you can on, on the primitives. Uh, so you can, you can go here and do a difference between this object and, uh, and the circle with, with radius 4. You would have it. So you're back to to being able to use this object, uh, this primitive as, as your own. In 3D space, we have sim a similar thing called polyhedron. The problem with polyhedrons is that it's very hard to, from your own mind, write down polyhedrons. So usually you would use this if you want to export uh, some files from an external software, or like uh, Oliver did, uh, uh, generate it from, from, a, from, a, from another piece of software with your own scripts. And as an example of polyhedrons, uh, let's see what we have here. Uh, polyhedrons, example 11. 
So this is an example of how a polyhedron description would be. So you define a point list uh, of vertices in 3D space, and you define uh, which faces you want to build from these vertices. The only problem with this is that you are, you are responsible for making a watertight object in this case. And if you don't, uh, you will get an error. So if I, for instance, wanted to, if, if for instance, I take away one, one polygon, I will have a hole here. And when I do that, every subsequent operation that required me to have a solid, like a difference, will fail. But it's possible to debug these things. Uh, in case you, you have problems. You can also have like faces that turn that turn inward uh, that are hard to debug. That is possible too. It should be possible to uh, to debug these things. Or did I do it wrong? For one. Okay, right. So I have a face that's turning the wrong way, so it's uh, hard to understand what it means. So you can color this separately to illustrate that something is wrong with your file. Good. Um, if you're unhappy about uh, writing down and using source code to describe objects, it's also possible to import existing ex uh, file, external files. So you can go back to this. You can. We can import, for instance, a 2D object. Let's see which one I'm going to import. Example. A DXF file. So a DXF file is some, typically something you would create from a, from a classic 2D CAD uh, software, like AutoCAD. Or we, uh, usually I use QCAD a lot. Let's see. If something goes wrong, uh, it's hard to say. I have a console here. I, would love to. I think I just found a bug. <laughs> okay. Here. So if something goes wrong, you can actually get the text output from the openness guide in this in this window, and you can see what's what's going on. So I just open the the demo. Okay, it worked now. So here is a, a, a 2D file that just loaded directly from DXF. And I can again uh, use the same uh, operations on the 2D primitive that I load that I can do with the 2D primitive that I create myself. Uh, and the same, with the same system we can do, uh, we can import 3D primitives, which was it, 12. So we can import an STL file uh, that has been created with any other, other, other modeling tool, and we can keep working on it uh, in OpenSCAD. And if you do a change in your existing, your old, your old existing original model, you, uh, you just change the file on the disk, and it will uh, apply all the operations that are done in OpenSCAD automatically. So as an example of the, this exact file, uh, I can show you here. It's the formatting is a bit hard to read on such a big font. But you import a, you import a model. You rotate the model so that it flips around. And then you translate it in 3D space. And then you take a difference between a sphere and that model. And you get then a, a cutout of a sphere that you can use for as a stamp or something. So now, uh, effectively, we have lots of different ways of creating primitives, everything from using the basic basic primitives uh, to defining your own primitives or to actually Im importing primitives uh, or whole models that other people or yourself have created in tools that are more, more convenient to use for, for those modeling jobs without taking away the, the, the benefit of using OpenSCAD for the rest of the stuff. So then I can, for instance, load in an existing 3D model <coughs> and if I want to make a keychain of it, I just subtract the cylinder and I have a keychain from an existing 3D uh, STL file. Is it possible to define a variable that contains this um, 
let's say, combination of different primitives and simply use you know, those variables to interact with each other? Yeah, I'm not sure what I yeah, understood. I mean, like, for instance, this is a combination of different shapes. Yeah. Can I define a variable that represents this combination and then um, use that to operate with other shapes? Yeah, so this is, uh, I will cover this a little bit later. Uh, this is because uh, in addition to being able to, to define primitives and move them around, we also have a number of language constructs that makes uh, reuse and, uh, and other tedious <laughs> tasks more autom automatic. And I will go through them. Uh, to get an idea of what is possible. I won't do everything, but I will just do the, ba the basic uh, things. Let's see if I just forgot anything. Uh, so instead of doing a primitive, I will just start from scratch and model something that uh, could make sense. I'm not sure what I would model, because uh, keychain, the keychain idea is already taken. So, so actually, I wrote this presentation of mine uh, sitting in, behind the Pantheon in Rome. So I was coming inspired by some of the, the architecture. So I figured out maybe I should just try to build some, something Roman. So I figured out I will try to build a, a, Roman, a Roman column with OpenSCAD. Uh, because that will probably highlight some of the features that you, can, you could use. And it also kind of then discuss parameterization uh, as well as, uh, as other features. So if you're not very picky about uh, your columns. A column is basically a cylinder, right? And it has a radius, for instance, 100 millimeters, and it has a height. So, if you're a column geek, uh, this would then be a, I guess, a Doric column. Um, this probably works well for certain certain purposes, but it's not really a nice column. Nice columns usually have flutes and it has a base. And you might not want to be happy with your, with the, the initial choice of size. So, just to go further with this, we want to add some flutes. Flutes are those cutouts that go in the ring around, around the uh, cylinder, uh, usually. And a flute is basically just a cylinder that is subtracted from this another cylinder, but lots of them. So, in this case, I would, I want to model the, my negative cylinder. So I just make first, I first make my first cylinder transparent, so I can see what I'm doing. And I make my, my, my cutout. So I want to cut this out, but I want to cut it out from the, from the edge. In this case, I do the same thing as before. So I move it uh, on approximately a radius out. And then I take the difference between those two. Now we have a nice column with one cutout. Of course, if I just know all the positions of all the cutouts, I can just kind of take this line and copy it 24 times, uh, which is a bit tedious. So since OpenSCAD was written by programmers, we know how to be lazy. So, but first of all, I need to figure out how do I want to position my cylinders. So what we have, either I can calculate the exact position of all these, these flutes, or I can use math. So I would use math, so I would say, let's rotate, let's first move this whole thing out to the side and then rotate it along the, the edge of the cylinder. And I want to rotate it, <coughs> let's say 45 degrees uh, around this, the C-axis, it will be there. So I can just figure out, if I figure out my degrees, I can just position it where I want. Really good. But I want 24 of them. And that's where we have something called loops. So I can say I can have a for loop. So I say for for fruit number, I have 24 of them. So I have 24, but they're all on top of each other. So I want to change the rotation of each of them. So each of them should be n 24th of a circle. So n times 360 divided by 24. And we get them all. So this is like a mod this is a, a model of the, the the mid section of a column. So let's say we want to model the, the, the bottom section. So we need to clear up some space. Uh, in this case, I will just I will just move all the 24 all the 24 flutes. I will just move them up 
maybe maybe 200 millimeters. Okay, that's that's a boring base. And also notice that the columns they have a very sharp edge. Usually the Romans they they liked kind of to curve this out a bit. So to do that, I need to kind of figure out how to kind of add, subtract like a, a something spherical uh, in each of these things. I know the code is going to be a bit messy, so we need to figure out a way how to kind of clean up our code and, and modularize, uh, modularize it a bit. And for this, we have something called modules. So I say that my flute is basically this one. So I will create a module called flute here. And I will move my, my code into, into the flute module. Mod module. So now we, cre we, we create a module and we instantiate it here 24 times. Now we should get the same thing. And now I want to figure out, okay, I want to make these flutes nicer. So let's focus on, on one flute and see what we can do with it. So this is a, see this as a, a flat end. And what we want is a, we want a union between the cylinder and the sphere, basically. So we take the union between the cylinder and the sphere with the same radius, like that. And if we now put back the, the flute into the object, we have nice cutouts. Now, maybe you, as I mentioned, maybe you haven't really decided how big this is going to be in your model. So, uh, to, if I want to change the size of this column now, I have to change a lot of numbers. And it's a bit annoying again. So what I really would like to do, I would like to create a module for the whole column and, and tell this module, module for instance, the, the diameter. I can do. So let's say it has a diameter. So I know use the radius of 100, means the diameter 200. So just to make it fun, I would say 150. No, no, nothing has changed because I'm just assigning a number to a value that doesn't, is not used anywhere. So what I want to use is to say I send in a diameter of 150, and I want to use that in my, in my design. So every time I use a radius of 100, what I want to do is say diameter halves. Of course, it's a lot of work to write diameter, so I say I will just use D. And at the same time, the same thing here. I'm, tr I'm moving the flutes out with, uh, with uh, D halves. And if I do this, it should should work, except to know that the flutes are dimensioned for a big cylinder, but they are actually small. So I need to actually make these things uh, depend on the diameter. So it was one tenth of the diameter, <coughs> one tenth of the radius, actually. So it's, it's, it's going to be one twentieth of the diameter, right? So let me back. So we have the same, same column, but smaller. I know if I want to have fun, I can just instantiate this column multiple times. With different parameters and you can then uh, see that your parameterization works. And if you want to really test this, you could write a for loop here that just uh, iterates over all the, all the possible variables that you have in the values and you'll see if it breaks and if your model is, is solid enough. At the same time, we can we can uh, we can add add features to this column now. So we can we can do things like we can add the base, and the, adding a base is going to be the same the same concept as adding as adding a flute. We just go to our column module and we just start modeling something that, that resembles a base. So we want to say the base is going to be uh, twenty percent larger than the 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 the, 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 the the cylinder, the column itself, and it has, it's going to be the same height. And we need a semicolon. And no, something went wrong. So I should 
probably specify that this is a radius. And it's a bit high, because the base shouldn't be that high. So we move this thing up 200. So if the base should be something less than 200. OK, and the radius should never be a diameter times 1.2. It should be the radius times 1.2. So we have to divide by 2. <coughs> and there we go. And I won't spend too much time on, on making this perfect, because uh, I think you get the idea. Uh, but typically, for for the the base of the column, it's uh, it's something that is rotational symmetric. So if you want to make a nice base, you would create a 2D outline of what it looks like, and then just rotate it around using the the rotate extrude command as we did earlier, and uh, you then get a nice base. And you can also easily add, for instance, you want to say that I want to I want to trade tra I want to change the type of column of column instead of having then a a, a height a ratio that I don't understand. I will say I want to make it a Doric column and add a type parameter. And I can say then that uh, ratio uh, let's see I'll make it simple first. So uh, I can say if if type equals Doric, <coughs> I can then do add pronging constructs here that says that uh, ratio equals one to one to six, so uh, to six, and then say else if type uh, equals ionic. Etc. Uh, so you can you can do these typical program, program, programming constructs, uh, except you have to think about uh, one very important aspect of OpenSCAD. Once you go to this this level, you will re you quickly realize that OpenSCAD is actually not a programming language; it's a description language. It describes a 3D model. It doesn't execute anything. It just it's like HTML, but the 3D version of HTML. So you can't actually. So for loop is basically just a macro expansion that instantiates this object 24 times. So all the variables has to have compile time uh, values. And you can't have side effects. You can't add something to something that already exists. So you're bound to a, a relatively pure like functional paradigm in terms of programming. But uh, if you're not a programmer, think that you're actually writing a, a complex HTML file where you actually say that I want this object here, I want this object here. And you have certain, certain primitives that helps you and a construct that helps you Structural thing, and but as OpenSCAD is everything else uh, is always evolving. So every year that goes, some of the limitations of, of OpenSCAD changes, and some of them are uh, some things get easier to do. Um, but for now, that's that's the limitation is that you cannot really reassign anything to anything. Um, Yeah, we also have some some features that could be interesting. We have uh, we, can, we can color certain parts of our object. So if I want to have a red base, I have to say color red, and everything under that color will be red. And we can also make it uh, transparent, and uh, which is really good for kind of structuring your code and uh, and being able to identify uh, pieces. And people use this for making kind of visual mock-ups of, of 3D objects for documentation purposes, for instance. Uh, another feature that is very, very uh, useful is that you can uh, you can save this model away and use it as a library for future use. So in this case, I can say I want to save, save my file as, uh, <coughs> as column. And I can open a new file, and I can say use column SCAD, and then I can say column 100. I might have destroyed the file by doing all the type things, but uh, let's see. Uh, here we are. OK. 
Okay. Does this work? Okay, here we go. Um, so now I have made my file external, and I can then instantiate it from an external file. And this is a very powerful feature since you know, people can share the libraries, and you can just use someone else's uh, library code without knowing what's inside, as long as this person documented the entry point well. And, uh, and uh, you can become part of the community. And a lot of these libraries are already available. Uh, Thingiverse has, I think, uh, 5,000 open SCAD designs now. Uh, and there's a lot of libraries there and a lot of interesting objects. So it's, uh, and since everything is source code, it's very easy to go there and, and get ideas for to, to, to model and how to, how to do it. Uh, there's a bunch of advanced stuff that I will not cover uh, right now, but if you look at the cheat sheet, uh, you can see there are, there are things that I haven't really covered here. You, have, you can specify matrices, you can do convex hulls, Minkowski sums if you are mathematicians. Uh, you have a, a number of mathematical functions. Uh, and there is also, uh, you have things like projections, where you can kind of extract the tr uh, 2D cut from a 3D object. And also there's a documentation available. Uh, so you can just, you can go there and it, most of the stuff is documented. And it's actually a wiki, so if you find bugs documentation, you just go there and change it anonymously, and it works. Uh, I think that's also enough for uh, demo. Uh, we don't have so much time, so I'll just quickly, uh, as I promised, show you some examples. Quick question, export Yeah, uh, yeah you can export uh, to the objects. You can export uh, as DXF. So you can actually export the 2D things. If you, if you instead of using 3D printers, you want to use OpenSCAD to create laser cut designs, you can actually export DXF. Um, uh, you can export STL as 3D objects. So you can also export uh, something called OFF. Uh, and OBJ. Hmm? OBJ. Uh, no, but um, there, is, there are plans for exporting AMF and OBJ because they are becoming increasingly uh, used formats, especially when you, once you want to do multicolored prints, you need to have a way of specifying that. So, oops, I will stand here again. So, OpenSCAD, as I mentioned, is used uh, mostly in like the, the RepRap and, and kind of maker and 3D printer enthusiast maker communities. Uh, but since it's used a lot for OpenSCAD, uh, for RepRap itself, actually, OpenSCAD is used to create the 3D models for the RepRaps. So this is actually the official Prusa design. I just downloaded it from his GitHub account and put it in OpenSCAD, and it renders uh, like this, like a preview render with the transparency and everything that renders all the printed parts that are yellow, but also it renders the things that are all the vitamins in other colors. And this is used for documentation purposes. So you can see how it looks, and you can actually visually inspect that nothing collides. So it's like a lightweight kind of uh, professional CAD system in a way. And also uh, the load spot, uh, which uh, Alessandro showed you, uh, are also partially designed in OpenSCAD. Uh, there's another design called Mendel 90, which is a fully OpenSCAD design. Actually, the guy who made Mendel 90, uh, he went to the point where he actually op he modeled every single nut and bolt in the whole system as in OpenSCAD, so we can create this kind of engineering uh, uh, drawings, which are used for documentation purposes, because it's a, it's a kit you build yourself. So you just have a parameter saying explode, not explode for each module, and if you say explode, it just kind of moves everything apart in according to some formulas. And uh, so even though OpenSCAD sounds, looks very, very simple from when you start programming, once you start building more and more complex models, you can build very, very uh, interesting uh, assemblies. And of course, you cannot print this at itself, but it's like, this is just the assembly of all the printed objects. So I, he would, he would, so the guy who write this, he would write a script and run up with that on a command line, and you will spit out all the STL files for all the designs in one big directory and just print it all in, in one go. So, so you don't really have to click around and do export every single object. You can also do that scripted outside of OpenSCAD using your own tools. 
Uh, this is an interesting project called the RoboHand, uh, which I found the other day, which is a robotic prosthesis system uh, designed in OpenSCAD, uh, which is meant to, to help uh, children that have lost a limb or are born with a deformation uh, and doesn't have healthcare and where they come from that they cannot afford to buy a $10,000 prosthetics. This is like $150 prosthetics uh, printed on the MakerBot. And the kids are very happy about it. So this is a new project that just spawned a few months ago and they are already starting a Kickstarter-like thing for getting funding and to take it uh, into the wild. So um, the interesting things are going on that kind of reaches outside of the, the rapper communities. Is it available on the yeah, this is on Thingiverse. So the, the 3D model for this thing is, is on Thingiverse, uh, and you can download and print it. And MakerBot donated a few printers to these guys to help them uh, get off the ground. So, so it looks like there are, things are interesting. Things are going, going well there. Of course, uh, it's all a bit covered MakerBot Customizer. Uh, MakerBot Customizer is it's basically open SCAD with a different uh, user interface to change the parameters in modules. So what actually happens here is that MakerBot, they, have, they run OpenSCAD on the command line on an EC2 Amazon server. And uh, they just, you can write certain comments in your source code, and those comments are automatically extracted into parameters. Uh, and you can just set different types of parameters. In, in this case, you can set kind of shapes and patterns. In the second tab here, you can, you can say one parameter is, if, or is this going to be an iPhone 3 or an iPhone 4? And, um, and it then automatically adjust uh, the geometry of the model so that it, it fits that particular phone. And so this is nothing else than just open a with a different uh, user interface on top. Uh, so this, I'm just going to show some examples of things that have been modeled on open SCAD. Everything that I show here is uh, just taken from Thingiverse. I just search for open SCAD and get 5,000 hits and select the things that would make sense. So. And a lot of these things is like early wrap wrap stuff. So what people do when they get the tree printer, they, the first thing they do is they print boxes and design boxes. All this is designed in open SCAD. And credit card holders, small boxes, big boxes, conceptual boxes, drawers, battery boxes. And next thing that people tend to model is kind of jewelry pieces. This is a, a I couldn't believe that this was OpenSCAD when I saw it, but somehow it's a very simple OpenSCAD model. Yeah, here it is. And this works, it's actually it's flexible. And so people do different types of kind of mathematical jewelry. It's very, very common. And this is actually also done with the OpenSCAD. You just, come, you just use a, a, a grayscale a picture to offset the offset polygons in the set height and print it half transparent. Is this done in OpenSCAD? Yes. Okay, I haven't seen this before. Emmet. Uh, Emmet. Yeah. One print, one single object. Yeah. Emmet is the hero of making strange things out of one print. Source yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm not an expert in ma making things in OpenSCAD. Uh, I just write the code, but all the people, they make the models. And next thing people usually do is like home improvement, kind of fixing a broken cupboard, uh, kind of making things that are more personalized, making a water uh, tray for the cats, uh, handlebars, screw holders, nut holders, pit holders. <laughs> I'm not sure uh, why sometimes. This is for closing uh, plastic bags. This is for putting your soap in the shower. This is a broken uh, dimmer for, uh, for a light. So they put this printed out their own dimmer button instead of buying a new one. Measurement devices. Yeah, screwdriver holders. And of course then, <laughs> once we have done the functional things and you go on to toys, printing Legos is kind of a conceptual thing that's very important to play with. And <coughs> uh, this, I guess, it might also be one of MS I'm not sure. It's like a, yeah, this is a very interesting model. It's just, it's just a toy, but it's, it's, it kind of bends your mind in a way. And a friend of mine did uh, a parametric music box where you specify the notes in OpenSCAD as a string and it generates geometry to, to create that song. People do robots. Uh, 
screwdriver holders. <laughs> all the, all the, this guy wanted to kind of have a specific sound of his trumpet, so he needed to change the mouthpiece. So he went through a lot of iterations until he found the perfect shape for his sound. Door hinges, buttons, lot of knobs and buttons is one of the favorite things to model. Or more like conceptual designs, it's like more like a water turbine design. I'm not sure if it actually works, but uh, I guess it could. People even do things like key duplicator, parameterized keys, you just uh, specify the, the, the five parameters for how deep every key is and you print out the copy. And uh, you can use it for penetration testing. People do like uh, bearing, print all printable bearings. I think it's another MS Designs which is printed in one, in one shot. So it's, uh, yeah. He almost won a make about. <laughs> he got beaten by the parametric music box in the in the competition. Here's more like mechanical assemblies, or a more conceptual designs of that are more complex of all all engines. And the only missing thing you know, on my radar is more like mathematical surfaces and stuff. And I guess now that the, the mathematical uh, community has discovered OpenSCAD, we will see a lot of those in the future. <laughs> so. Thanks a lot. And if you need to contact me, this is my thing.